Very good afternoon to all. It is our pleasure to welcome you all again on the one week for FTP on and purely on the fundamentals of purely the fundamentals of mechanical engineering. Knowledge 4.0 webinar series is one of the unique and distinct initiative of Tenure of Technology under the guidance of our honorable chairman, C. P. Sridham, who is one of the uh, well known uh, industrialist, first generation entrepreneur, and managing director of MK Group of Companies. Under Knowledge 4.0 webinar series, we have been conducting webinars such as Technical Webinar Series, Research Webinar Series, Career Guidance Webinar Series, and Innovative Talk Webinar Series. Along with this series, we, have, we are also conducting international seminars, workshops, and uh, conferences, and faculty development programs. So today, we are, we are, we, we are uh, going on faculty development program. So today, in this afternoon session, we have uh, Dr. Sivaprasad Devias, Professor from Triple uh, Kanjigram. Welcome you, sir, in this wonderful occasion. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And the Chinese technology was established in the year 2010 by our chairman, Honorable uh, Prince Ram. And today, our institute is being within top 10 among all other private engineering colleges in Tamil Nadu. It is our pleasure to uh, welcome all the uh, participants, those who are on the office screen. And once again, uh, once again, uh, Dr. Amy is of the ASR and Varsha for the content location. Let me request Varsha to introduce our ABS Super of the ABS, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. This is Varsha pursuing second year mechanical engineering at Chennai Institute of Technology. Excellence is not being the best, it is doing your best. One such person is Dr. Siva Prasad, ABS, Assistant Professor at Indian Institute of Technology at Indian Institute of Information Technology, Design and Manufacturing. He did his bachelor's degree at Sri Venkateshwara University, Tripadi, and his master's degree along with his PhD in Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. His area of specialization includes solid mechanics and design. His research interest involves computational continuum mechanics. He worked as an assistant professor at Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus from November 2016 to May 2018. Also worked as a postdoctoral research associate at University of Arizona, Tuscon, USA, from February 2016 to September 2016. He is a life member of Indian Society of Applied Mechanics. He has published various articles in journals of high repute and conferences. We are glad to have you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be there uh, among you. To discuss, not to deliver lecture, I would always say discuss various matters related to fundamentals of engineering design with uh, emphasis on failure, design for failure, etc. So my area is design for failure. So let me start, sir. Can I start? Uh, please, share? please, sir. You can share the screen and you can start, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Varsha. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Varsha, for your uh, generous uh, this, uh, introduction to me. Yeah. Yes, sir, please go ahead, sir. Before I start, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So before I start, um, I would like to tell you why I chose this topic: failure analysis in design using fracture mechanics. I didn't choose any particular topic in design. I chose uh, a very broad uh, topic called failure theories, and then uh, use of fracture mechanics in design, machine design in particular. But in general, it can be anything. It can be even design of materials. We can even design materials. That's that's what material scientists do. They design new materials. Okay. So here is a brief about uh, my credentials. Varsha has already told most most of those things. So I'll just display it for you to have a look at. I also have a brief experience at GE India Technology Center, Bangalore, working on fatigue problems. Right. Okay. So this is the outline of the presentation. I relook at the terms failure and fracture. Basically, you might have read this failure and fracture time and again, but I would like to give a different perspective. And then a historical perspective. How did it all start? Right? Then uh, mechanics of cracks as they evolved. Fatigue fracture, life prediction methods, etc. And then introduce the notion of damage mechanics. 
there is something called this damage variable and damage mechanics and the mechanics uh, hidden behind that damage and its applications to some manufacturing processes at the end we would like to analyze some real life engineering applications right so that's why we are doing this study and uh, finally i'll just give you a brief introduction very very superficial introduction to my favorite area mesh free methods two methods sph and peridynamics and their applications in simulating crack propagation in solids okay so with this i proceed further this is one of my favorite pictures this is a, a snapshot taken from this movie a scene from the last world in jurassic park in 1997 i was a kid then i was about in 9th standard or 10th standard the lady falls on the glass window of a bus and the glass doesn't shatter that means her impact was not sufficient to break the glass completely instead as i have shown in red circles cracks have nucleated at these three points and there are many other points which i have not highlighted but these three points are in contact with that lady so they are important so cracks have just nucleated and they got arrested now a minute movement if you remember if some of you have seen this movie after this scene the lady tries to keep calm but you can't really keep calm right nobody can really keep calm so it's like dead calm that's not possible so a slight movement will allow the crack to grow a slight movement of your hand fingers that will extend the crack so so why when does a crack arrest and when does it completely shatter so this is what has been very uh, you know uh, an interesting question for many material scientists mathematicians and uh, broadly speaking mechanical engineers to strengthen materials so that cracks get arrested and you will see longer life for that component for example buildings we see cracks on walls but we they will sustain for 60 years 100 years and some of the old temples in tamil nadu they have sustained for several years right so all this has has you know uh, like created some kind of uh, uh, special attention to me and i wanted to always pursue the strength of materials from fracture mechanics perspective and design materials and components from fracture mechanics perspective so with this brief introduction i move to you know uh, explaining you what failure and fracture means so i am in slide number 5 you might be seeing a connecting rod along with a piston where the connecting connecting rod has bent rather it has buckled right so now this we would call as a failure although we don't see any separation of materials right we call this as failure so failure is a very broad term it doesn't have to be separation of materials it can be like distortion severe distortion so that the component is not able to serve its intended purpose or it can be you know uh, for example uh, a dent in the car you know or uh, bent wheel all these things the cycle gets cycle will not move if the wheel rim gets bent right so all these are also failures on the other hand fracture is all about separation of materials creating a new surface so that's what what we are going to uh, look into for example in the bottom picture you see it's a pipe that contains a hole this hole is probably to allow a bolt to be seated there and there is no visible flaw on the left picture right in the bottom left picture where i i, I suppose my cursor is uh, visible to you all so in the left bottom picture you can see there is no visible flaw but then if you subject it to some kind of magnetic particle in inspection or uh, any other ultrasound inspection any other ndt technique what you will see is probably a flaw like this indicated by some color in this case it's magnetic particle color particles right so there is a flaw that is not visible to us it's these flaws which are responsible for fatty crack growth and failure so what we are going to worry about is the cases where such flaws are present and then how to analyze them that is our main motto but we will go step by step we will go first what we know right <coughs> yeah i am very fond of history especially scientific history is very interesting that will motivate you to further uh, pursue research or even in teaching if you if you motivate your students by talking a little bit of history i believe that they get att attend attentive they will they will feel attentive and get attracted to your teaching right so let's start with uh, the history about 500 years back 
So sometime in 15th, 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci started testing wires and he found that the length of the wire is a major factor in deciding the strength of that wire. So that's all. He didn't define the terms like stress, strain, or any, any of those physical quantities that we are aware of today were not introduced by Leonardo da Vinci. However, he just studied this, initiated these studies. Later on, Coulomb. I guess the spelling of Coulomb is uh, wrong. I'm sorry about that. It should have been C-O-U-L-O-M-B, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it will look like Coulomb in Tamil, right? I'm sorry about that. So Coulomb pioneered fracture of stones in compression, right? And then Oler. Oler curve is probably familiar to you in fatigue. In fatigue, those who have worked some 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 deeper, uh, those who have conducted some deeper studies in fatigue would know what a Oler curve means. So Oler investigated fatigue of locomotive axles, and then Kraska's failure theory or maximum shear stress theory for ductile materials. This is well well known to you. And then only they started studying this onset of the the SN diagram, the stress-based fatigue life determination introduced by Goodman. And then von Mises theory came. Von Mises theory is very popular now, the most, uh, you know, very versatilely used. Uh, even uh, it's called J2 flow theory, distortion energy theory, or octahedral stress theory. There are many names, right? Let me move to the next slide. Now, this is during World War. Whatever I shown before is before World War I. You see the year 1913, that's where I stopped. And you remember First World War started in 1919. So till then, there was no strong motivation for scientists to understand failure of materials. It was purely an academic interest and some industry interest, but there was no strong motivation. But during World War, when Hitler was behind US with heavy ammunition and armor, US, not only us all those all those uh, allied allied powers for example britain were under severe threat france were already occupied that was the situation when britain looked up to us and they wanted these ships to be made at a very uh, you know a short span and sent to the uh, war field so us manufactured most of these ships they are called liberty ships ss schenectady ships and uh, instead of doing riveting i repeat instead of doing riveting they did welding of plates. You know, ship contains several layers of plates. They are all welded together instead of riveting. Now, riveting was a common practice. They knew how to do it. But welding was new to them, at, especially at this large scale. So what happened? There was a, you know, uh, there were thermal stresses inbuilt. There are many specialists here in welding. Even I was talking to Dr. Dinakaran about uh, how welding induces residual stresses just before this talk. So it's nothing new to us, but then it was new to them. It was in the year 1930s, right? So it was new to them. They didn't anticipate the thermal stresses because of welding. So what happened? Uh, the moment they were taken to the Atlantic Ocean, you remember between US and the Europe, there is this Atlantic Ocean, which is very cold, right? So the moment they were taken to the shore of the Atlantic Ocean, overnight, 21 ships sunk because of ductile to brittle failure transition. They were all ductile materials when they were manufactured. Then you welded it, thermal stresses got locked inside and became residual stresses. Take them to the seashore. They try to contract, but the stresses inside do not allow them to contract. Residual stresses are responsible for breaking the specimen, breaking the entire ship into two halves, as you see, as you see here. The other one is post-World War. Okay, I'm not going to discuss much beyond this. It's just to motivate you why we need to study fracture mechanics. Yeah, so it all started with in the post World War, it all started with considering an elliptical hole in a plate. Stress concentration was nothing new to them, but stress concentration had only fillets, circular holes, etc. So they took an elliptical hole and then analyzed. Later on, so that was started by English, and then after English, Griffith gave energy release rate. Then Irwin came with the concept of critical energy release rate, gave that name, critical energy release rate. And then stress field around the central crack in a plate and introduce the term called stress intensity factor. So we are going to discuss what the difference between stress concentration factor and stress intensity factor is. When do these appear? And sometimes there is some overlap. That's also something that I will I would like to discuss. Then wells 
introduced clack tip opening displacement. It's called popularly CTOD. Nowadays, in most of the uniaxial tensile testing machines, you have this setup, CTOD measuring setup, right? And then J.R. Rice introduced J-integral, very popular. They are all analytical studies. The last two are analytical studies, completely, completely analytical. James R. Rice is very popular for J-integral. And then parallelly, SLB introduced energy momentum tensor. So, <clears throat> so starting with the stress field around an ellipsoidal inclusion, he came with an energy momentum tensor. <clears throat> okay. So why do cracks and defects occur? The answer is hidden here. Many materials undergo plastic deformation beyond an elastic limit. This is very well known to you. So what's happening when the plastic deformation is taking place? Very minute flaws are responsible for the plastic deformation. For example, if there are voids, very small circular voids, spherical voids, they get compressed or they get elongated depending upon the state of stress surrounding them. As a result, there will be severe plastic deformation. So that is the reason behind this macroscopic plastic deformation. Similarly, when it comes to uh, brittle materials, there will be micro cracks and those micro cracks may get extended or may get compressed. Again, that will lead to some small scale plasticity. It's called cast iron plasticity. So these are responsible for occurrence of defects. No material can be free from defects. No matter how well you do the processing, how well you do heat treatment, there will be some defects always present, either through thermodynamic argument or through natural state argument, we can establish this. <clears throat> now, let's, let's uh, get into uh, the basics slowly. So what is stress concentration factor? In an otherwise uniform material, if there is a stress riser, like a hole or a crack, or a sudden change in cross-section, gradual change in cross-section like this bottle. You can see this bottle starting from a very <coughs> broad cross-section, there is a sudden change in the cross-section. So all these things are responsible for rising the stress. The stress concentration takes place. As you can see my cursor, this left figure, these red lines indicate contour lines of constant stress. So sigma infinity is the stress applied at the far field. So the word far field is used whenever you are actually having a very small flaw. And the boundaries are very far off. Boundaries at which you are applying the stress are very far off. You use the word far field. right? So at the far away boundaries, you have this kind of stress. And somewhere in between, there is this flaw. Flaw means some hole. So here I took a circular hole. So this red line, instead of being straight, it bends close to the circle, indicating that the lines of constant stress have a tendency to bend like this. So close to the circle, it's not constant. Away from the circle only, it is constant. Close to the circle, it has this parabolic, hyperbolic uh, distribution of uh, stresses. On the right figure, I am showing the distribution of stresses ahead of the hole. <coughs> Excuse me for that. So, right at the diameter ends, you will have three times the applied stress. Now, you can say the stress concentration factor in a circular hole where the boundaries are far off, where the boundaries are far off is three times. Kt. Kt is the symbol used for this theoretical stress concentration factor, and that factor is three. For the case where there is a circular hole in a plate loaded at the far boundaries. Boundaries are very far from the hole. Now let us see what happens if the boundaries are finite. The left figure, I show you a graph of stress concentration factor to the ratio of the size of the hole to the width of the component. Now as the width of the component is infinitely long, you will get three the concentration factor. But as the width keeps decreasing, you will see that the stress concentration factor also decreases. Right? So this is the <clears throat> concept of stress concentration. Right? So here we have not yet introduced stress intensity factor. We will see what it is in later slides. Okay, there are two types of fracture. 
one is brittle fracture the other is ductile fracture right so in brittle fracture the intergranular cleavage can take place or transgranular cleavage can take place in intergranular cleavage it will be very rugged surface whereas in transgranular cleavage it will be a smooth surface so <clears throat> on the other hand in ductile fracture there will be some inclusions which is responsible for the growth of the voids so mostly it will be transgranular and it will result in a dimpled surface right now you know these uh, failure theories for ductile materials there are of three types maximum shear stress criterion distortion energy or one mesis criterion and then ductile coulomb more criterion coulomb more is a it's a combination of two scientists more you very well know more is more circle and coulomb is what i have shown in the initial slide so both of them together i have worked on this kind of criteria failure criteria so let's get into one by one <coughs> excuse me <coughs> again for brittle materials you have maximum principal stress criterion brittle coulomb more criterion and modified more criterion right so let's look at them uh, one by one in details so this is stress cause criterion so before i get into it uh, it's essential to know that stress is not a single scalar quantity it's a second order tensor why is it so it contains two directions one is the direction along which the force is being applied the other is the direction perpendicular to the plane on which the force is acting imagine this plane which is inclined at 45 degrees to the vertical and you have some arbitrary force okay so the state of stress normal stress is given by the direction of the force and the direction of the plane if you uh, incline the plane in a different orientation then the component of force acting towards the normal direction will change therefore <coughs> to mention the stress on a plane you should mention both the plane direction as well as the direction of the force so two directions are required remember in a vector you need a you need a direction and you need magnitude for a second order tensor you need two directions and magnitude for a third order tensor you need three directions and magnitude like that you can keep <coughs> introducing more and more so in the current scenario we need only second order tensors but of course in elasticity you have fourth order tensor also that is the elastic modulus it's also not a scalar quantity it's a vector it's a tensor quantity fourth order tensor we will not get into those details because that's much beyond the present scope for now we will just digest the fact that stress tensor stress is actually a second order tensor physical quantity and it depends upon the coordinate system that you choose for example if the state of stress is written like sigma 11 1, sigma 12 1, sigma 13 sigma 21 sigma 22 sigma 23 sigma 31 sigma 32 sigma 33 and so on it means that you are choosing a particular coordinate system which is cartesian coordinate system this is x axis y axis z axis one corresponds to x two corresponds to y and three corresponds to z axis so if you take a thumb rule then you can choose a so this is this uh, right handed rule you can use the right handed rule and choose a coordinate system of your choice on the other hand principal coordinate system that is nothing but taking the major principal axis and minor principal axis and uh, arranging a three day, three coordinate system so that's also a cartesian coordinate system but is that is unique to every point so that is called principal stresses and principal directions you might have seen they are nothing but eigen values of this stress quantity whatever i have written in the cartesian coordinate system you take the eigen values after that of that matrix what you get is the principal stresses and the corresponding eigen vectors are nothing but the principal directions right 
okay now why do we need all this i want to tell that simply telling sigma greater than sigma y means failed is easy for one dimensional state of stress for a generalized state of stress like connecting rod piston those complex geometries will have generalized state of stress how will we able to uh, identify a failure criteria so for that we need to know how to find out the maximum shear stress the maximum shear stress is nothing but difference between the maximum principal stress and the minimum principal stress divided by 2 right sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 is the maximum shear stress remember when you find out the principal stresses you have to arrange it in the ascending order or descending order sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3 always you do that as a common practice there is nothing like rule uh, physics will remain the same but then it's a common practice sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3 and then use it in the stress cost criterion for designing a component right so this is the maximum shear stress criterion and of course 2 and 2 can be cancelled and the inequality becomes sigma 1 minus sigma 3 greater than or equal to sy now on the right side i am showing you the yield locus yield locus means locus means you know <coughs> locus means a uh, set of points which satisfy a particular equation and that forms a surface or a curve depends uh, if it is three dimensions it will be a surface if it is a two dimensions like what i have shown here it's a curve so these horizontal lines inclined lines and vertical lines they are nothing but the yield locus for stress cross criterion under plane stress conditions right so I have indicated case one, case two, case three. This is taken from Shigley's machine design book. So Shigley, Shigley is a very popular uh, book, right? The machine design. So that's a very popular book. Uh, very, very useful uh, if you are pursuing uh, higher studies also. Right. So for plane stress, this is how it looks like a hexagon. If you look at three-dimensional uh, yield surface, it will look like a hexagonal cylinder. i have not put that picture here because that will confuse the three dimensional state but the two dimensional state it can be shown by this uh, hexagon right okay so in this sigma 1 minus sigma 3 greater than or equal to sy if the left hand side is positive it would be <coughs> this uh, this line that is in the second quadrant and if the left hand side is negative it would be this line that is in the fourth quadrant and then if sigma 3 is zero then it would be uh, these two vertical lines that is perpendicular to the sigma a axis and if sigma 1 is zero then it is these two lines the horizontal lines like that you have six combinations and you get these six straight lines okay so that you can work out okay i am not going to get deeper the next is very important the uh, distortion energy criterion or von mises criterion even if you work in theory of plasticity you know this is very very you know this is the starting point of theory of plasticity <coughs> the measure of energy consumed in causing permanent plastic deformation is called distortion energy i repeat the measure of energy causing permanent plastic deformation is called distortion energy now if the distortion energy due to the applied load exceeds the distortion energy due to the yield strength then you say that the material has plastically deformed started plastically deformed right so let us again take this principal stresses if you write down the strain energy and then subtract the volume energy from that right like this so i have defined this uh, sigma average which is nothing but arithmetic average of all the three principal stresses you take that arithmetic average and then subtract it from each of the elements in the stress tensor from that matrix you subtract this quantity sigma average from all the quantities in that matrix what you get is the second solid figure sigma 1 minus average sigma 2 minus average sigma 3 minus average this kind of state of stress is only going to cause plastic deformation distortion right so only this energy is responsible for the plastic deformation not the volume energy right so the given stress uh, cube is split into 
two types of loading. One is hydrostatic loading that is equal stress in all the directions, sigma average in x, y, and z. And the second cube shows different stresses on different planes, right? So that will only distort the solid. If you take this energy, it looks like this. So for a general state of stress, the strain energy density is written, the distortion energy is written like this, and that should be always greater than or equal to Sy for the failure to occur. And the yield locus in a plane stress looks like an ellipse. So if you look at three-dimensional case, it will be a circular cylinder. In Truscott's case, it is a hexagonal regular cylinder, and here it's a cylindrical, it's just a cylinder, a circular cylinder. And the axis is nothing but the hydrostatic axis. Sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3. Remember that sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3 will never intersect the, these two cylinders, which shows that the hydrostatic state of stress will not cause plastic deformation in regular solids. That means defect-free solids. If uh, the solid is porous, then the hydrostatic state of stress will also cause plastic deformation. That's a different thing. We'll discuss it towards the end when I introduce damage mechanics. Right now, <coughs> let's compare for the plane stress condition, what is the change in the, what is the difference between the yield locus due to one Mises criterion and yield locus due to Truscott's criterion. Right? So you can see some regions are left out in Truscott's. Sorry. The one Mises, I mean slide number 16, I, so I hope I didn't disturb many of you. I, by mistake, I moved to the next slide. Okay, so in one Mises criterion, which is actually an ellipse, eh, several regions are actually captured. Whereas in Truscott's criterion, uh, it's not captured. Only some vertices fall on the one Mises uh, solid, one Mises curve, which shows that Truscott's criterion is more conservative. For example, you start from zero stress, and I slowly increase along this some line. You can see my cursor. So according to Truscott's criterion, the material would have yielded. But according to one Mises criterion, it would not have yielded. So Truscott's criterion is conservative compared to one Mises criterion. Okay, conservative means it will give a thicker dimension compared to one Mises criterion. You can check this. You can take a circular shaft, subject it to bending, and then see uh, what should be the diameter, show that it doesn't exceed the working stress. Working stress means yield stress divided by factor of safety or ultimate stress divided by factor of safety. So you can check whether the stress exceeds the working stress and based on that, you can find out the diameter. You will see that if you use stress cost criteria, you will get a bigger diameter compared to one basis criteria. That's what I mean by conservatism. Coulomb Moore criterion. On a lighter note, I would like to say this Coulomb Moore, whenever we Tamil people say no, it will uh, feel uh, like uh, more Coulomb. <laughs> so it's it's Coulomb more. Uh, okay. So let's come back to the uh, come back to the actual. So the stress tensor uh, for a sorry sorry. Uh, so the yield yielding behavior for certain materials are really sometimes very very different. For example, I have written here gray cast iron and magnesium display different yield points in tension and compression. If the difference is too much, you know, three times, four times, for example, if the yield in tension is 300 MPa and the yield in compression is 50 MPa, that is significantly different. Around six times it is different. In such cases, we cannot use the one basis or Truscott's criterion for failure design, design for failure. We are, uh, rather we have to find out a different way. So here is a modification given by Coulomb and Moore. So this is uh, maximum principal stress sigma 1, minimum principal stress sigma 3. But uh, you have this uh, equation of a straight line, sigma 1 by yield strength in st uh, tension minus sigma 3 by yield strength in compression must be greater than or equal to 1. So if it is equal to 1, it has just failed. Greater than 1 means it has failed, like permanent deformation has taken place. Because of this, because of this, uh, straight, again, there are six combinations possible with this uh, inequality. 
putting all the combinations you get uh, two vertical lines two horizontal lines and two inclined lines you can see now that uh, comparing this with the trescas criterion trescas criterion here both the inclined lines are of same slope and all the vertical lines are of same same slope as well as same uh, what you call length also on the other hand in coulomb mohr criterion you see that the lengths are not the same they are inclined at a different slope uh, this is why it is used for materials which display asymmetry asymmetry means no symmetry asymmetry in the yielding behavior okay so this is the heat locus but when i put uh, syt is equal to syc okay what happens it is uh, you can recover trescas criterion if i put syt is equal to syc you can recover trescas criterion and this solid will this uh, curve yield locus will look like trescas yield surface okay okay next for brittle materials it's very straight forward very simple because brittle materials do not undergo significant plastic deformation what do you use you do not use yield strength you use ultimate tensile strength right that is where the breaking point happens in stress strain curve so when the maximum principal stress exceeds the ultimate tensile strength that is called maximum principal stress criterion again the first maximum eigen value of the stress tensor becomes more than sy sut then you have considered it as failed then brittle coulomb mohr criterion is same as ductile coulomb mohr criterion you just verify this ductile coulomb mohr criterion has syt and syc in the denominators <clears throat> on the other hand brittle one has sut and suc that's the only difference the modified mohr criterion especially for the plain stress case i have put here is a little different so it depends upon the ratio of the minimum stress to the maximum stress if the ratio of the minimum stress to the maximum stress the magnitude is less than or equal to 1 then you have to use this and if it is greater than 1 you have to use this where n is the factor of safety right so with this i'll close the failure of uh, materials failure theories in materials now let me take up uh, uh, before this i'll just summary is uh, what i have uh, written here so we have discussed uh, ductile material theories and brittle material theories how do you classify if the fracture strain strain to fracture is greater than 5% then you call it as ductile material it's only a rule of thumb and if it is less than 5% it is brittle material right and ductile to brittle transition depends upon not only temperature but also the rate of loading you suddenly break a specimen and gradually break a specimen there is going to be different uh, difference in the strain at which fracture occurs there will be more plastic deformation if you allow slow plastic slow loading if you do fast loading there will be lesser plastic deformation <coughs> if time permits i'll explain why it is so <coughs> so if it is ductile you just have to verify whether yield intention and compression are the same if they are same then whether it is conservative or not if you want a conservative design you can go for maximum shear stress theory if you want to have a optimal design low cost design then go for distortion energy theory if the yield intention and compression are not the same go to ductile coulomb more again same with the brittle behavior if you want to be conservative use brittle coulomb if you want a if you want a optimal design low cost design go for modified mohr right okay then all the while we have been deciding uh, uh, all the while we have been discussing only failure theories i would be interested to show you what happens uh, in a variable loading static loading is very something that is we know like the buildings uh, or uh, very rare static loading is very rare fitting loading is very common where there is a variation in the loading not only the direction but also magnitude that is called variable loading if it's a fixed load of magnitude direction can change for example a beam carrying a gear at the middle gear a gear is there at the middle 
the gear is rotating at some very high speed say i don't know in steam turbines uh, in, in power plant turbines the rpm speeds can go up to 10000 10000 rpm you imagine a shaft uh, that is rotating with the gear mounted on it uh, at that speed uh, so the top fiber will experience alternatively tension and compression that is the origin of the fitting loading in rotating shafts like that there are many other cases repeated loading is called fitting loading no uh, there are uh, the fracture behavior of materials in fitting is like something like this where does fitting fracture occur for example let's say i told that every material will have some defect we cannot avoid a defect free material at all right so there will be origin of crack somewhere where there is an inclusion if it is an alloy there will be inclusions if it is a, a cast material there will be blow holes if it is a formed material there will be grain boundaries which have interlocked and residual stresses are there right so there are many origins so you can have a crack anywhere let's say there is a crack here very small crack crack when i say no very small crack 5 microns 50 microns at most 50 microns but that flaw is sufficient to cause stress concentration and over the course of time you know it will fail right so what happens the crack grows and stops grows and stops so what you see is here striations are markings right am i am i audible to all of you is there any question would you like to stop me here or yes sir please go ahead sir please go ahead at last we will uh, summarize the question and we will ask sir thank you sir thank you yeah so there are these markings which indicate that the cracks open and close open and close open and close and finally after reaching this point the end of the region b it will fracture completely so sudden fracture so slowly it will fracture and suddenly it will fracture so point a region a is where crack growth has just started starting with a small flaw then the region b is where there are crack markings fitting crack growth markings and region c is where it is catastrophic failure so this is a typical uh, feature seen in fitting cracks fitting life prediction have three methods stress based life prediction strain based life prediction and then fracture mechanics approach so we are going to just uh, briefly review the first two fracture mechanics i'll go deeper okay and uh, when do you use which one the first one that is stress based life prediction method is useful for high cycle fitting okay basically i want to classify now itself the stress based and strain based are till a point where you initiate a damage initiate a creation of crack after crack forms of course you have to use fracture mechanics based life prediction approach you cannot use stress based or strain based approach that is the old motto okay <clears throat> so between stress based or strain based for high cycle fitting you will use stress based and for low cycle fitting you will use strain based that is the thumb rule that is given in shigley's book also okay so let's get into a bit more details a stress based life prediction method contains a chart that shows fatigue strength in the y axis versus the number of cycles right so in the low cycle fatigue region it will have a very small slope and uh, it is not so very well uh, popular in that region on the other hand on the high cycle fatigue region there is something called uh, finite life uh, the region and infinite life region so the fatigue strength increases with increase in the life cycle sorry fatigue strength this is actually the y axis is nothing but how much uh, load it can sustain for, for it to run a number of cycles for example if a component you want it to run for 10 power 5 cycles then the strength of maximum strength of that component is corresponding to this which is about some 60 mpa or 60 kilo pascals per square inch etc sorry 60 kilo pounds per square inch etc kpsi right and uh, as the life cycle increases 
the ability for it to withstand keeps decreasing and beyond a certain point there is a horizontal line which is called endurance limit that is the endurance limit so if uh, the stress is below this level the life can be treated to be infinite right so as a rule of thumb if a, if a component can sustain 10 power 6 life cycles then the corresponding stress at which it is just failing at 10 power 6 cycles is called the endurance limit endurance limit is a very very fundamental thing and it is popular only in ferrous alloys in non ferrous alloys endurance limit is nearly zero or very very negligible so there is what i mean to say is uh, at some point or the other non ferrous alloys will definitely fail but ferrous alloys like steels they may not fail at uh, such low levels of stress right having said that this is all for plain specimens there are no notches there are no cracks plus so only for this plain specimen this thing can be used when there is a notch you have to use stress concentration factor and stress notch sensitivity factor all those things will come into picture which we will not discuss elaborately we are interested in crack not in notch this is strain based life prediction method so in strain based life prediction method uh, obviously number of cycles is very low here so only in 10, 10 cube to 10 power 4 region you will apply the strain based method and uh, strain amplitude is in the y axis and the x axis it is the number of cycles for the sake of clarity the effect of plastic strain on the strain based method is shown here up to a certain point uh, elastic strain alone will actually cause the difference but beyond a certain point elastic plastic strain will also cause a significant difference right so no matter how much the plastic strain is elastic strain will, will cause the major damage right so if it is a mixed cycle fatigue also you tend to use uh, this uh, what you call strain based uh, method only so i will deal with a mixed cycle uh, loading case in later uh, slides where you will uh, use miner's rule i will introduce miner's rule in later slides yeah now the fracture mechanics the starting point of fracture mechanics is to understand the modes of failure or modes of fracture mode 1 mode 2 mode 3 there are three modes very commonly used in fracture mechanics again all these things are given in shigley's book it's a very popular book and you can also refer to i have gone deeper so you can also refer to prashant kumar's book on elements of fracture elements of fracture mechanics by prashant kumar uh, he was a professor at iit kanpur uh, so I, although i never attended his course i have followed his book very uh, very often i have referred to his book yeah so <clears throat> when the motion of the material ahead of the crack tip this is called crack tip when i say ahead it is this part behind means this part because crack is growing this uh, this direction ahead means forward direction right crack is going in this direction that is ahead so this is behind right so when the uh, applied load is parallel to the motion of the crack sorry when the motion of the material ahead of the crack tip is perpendicular to the crack plane it is called opening mode or mode one when the motion of the material is parallel to the crack plane then it is called shear mode and the motion of the material is parallel but out of plane out of plane it's like tearing a paper etc out of plane is called mode 3 the most common modes are mixed mode that is mode 1 and mode 2 mode 3 is very rare somewhere where the torsional load is uh, predominant no there only you use mode 3 otherwise mode 1 and mode 2 are common <coughs> now in an elliptical hole so that's the starting point right i told in the history of uh, fracture mechanics evolving evolution english solution is the starting point for stress concentration and stress intensity so you can see this actually you can uh, find this in any uh, machine design books uh, you can find this uh, where uh, uh, elliptical holes uh, the stress concentration is given by sigma times 1 plus 2a by b where a is the major axis of the ellipse 
and b is the minor axis of the ellipse you see if b tends to zero it becomes a crack ellipse gets compressed no ellipse ellipse become flat as b tends to zero it becomes a crack and when a is equal to b what happens 1 plus 2 3 this is nothing but the stress concentration factor for the circular hole right so a is equal to b means circle so a is equal to b means circle and therefore you get a uh, stress center stress concentration factor of a circular hole so that's a special case when a is far greater than b it becomes a crack then the applied stress t sigma t goes infinitely higher right is as b tends to zero you can see sigma t goes to infinity but that's not the case in reality stresses can't go to infinity if stresses go to infinity all the materials will fail the moment you apply load no matter what this sigma is here even if it is 1 1 kilo pascal or 1 mega pascal you will uh, this stress predicts that stresses will go infinity at this point but that's not practically possible because we see that even there is crack uh, the component continues to serve its purpose for small loads right so there is something hidden in the mathematical part right so if b is not nearly zero b is usually in the order of interatomic distances or lattice spacing if it is a metallic polycrystalline material or a single crystal material you have lattice parameters right so it is it will be in that order for example uh, you know burgers vectors magnitude will be in the order of a few angstroms and nanometers similarly this cracks bit can also be in the order of uh, a few nanometers right so it's not nearly zero that is the point here then griffith came up with energy release rate right so since uh, this is stress solution by english has this problem as b goes to zero it becomes infinity griffith came with an energy criterion you keep giving strain energy to a solid and then suddenly at one point crack pops up right so this crack will pop up only when the applied energy exceeds the surface energy every surface every solid has a surface every every matter for the for that matter every material or substance contains surface tension or surface energy for example liquids we are all very well aware the meniscus forms because of that surface tension and it is very hard to make it flat did you ever try making a water surface flat it's not possible you have to put in a lot of energy because you have to overcome that surface tension that surface energy has to be overcome to create a flat surface even in solid to create a flat clear surface by cutting you have to put in a lot of energy you might have done filing operation in your first year many of the students might have done filing operation in filing the saw cutting to make it a perfect straight it's not possible it will be a rugged surface why is it so because the energy that you are giving in is slowly overcoming the surface energy and creating a new surface so it's not an easy task to create a clean surface and then after that you will do the filing operation i'm talking about fitting fitting workshop so in that you will do filing operation to make it smooth right so uh, something similar is similar, something analogous is here when you want to create a new surface you have to overcome that surface energy that is associated with those two surfaces where will you go how will you overcome you have to give that energy by pulling the solid as you keep pulling the solid then the crack forms the very fundamental energetics uh, reasoning behind formation of cracks in solids okay so the mathematical part de by da the rate of change in energy of the system per unit area created must be equal to zero because that is the total energy change that will be equal to zero by law of conservation d pi by da right so this is first law of thermodynamics we are not invoking second law of thermodynamics d pi by da means change in potential energy plus change in the surface energy due to new area creation must be equal to zero this is the starting point of the mathematical approach for determining the uh, severity of a crack right 
if you extend it further and use a english solution to write a pi is the potential energy nothing but strain energy so strain energy can be written as uh, stress into strain and that comes out to be this uh, this expression pi sigma square a square b by e where a is the crack length half crack length and b is the width of the plate and uh, surface energy is given in terms of surface tension surface tension you know it's actually work per unit area multiply by area what you get is the total energy surface energy gamma s is surface energy per unit area or nothing but surface tension force per unit length so this is something very fundamental we read in our uh, 12th class etc right so when you equate when you put this uh, this these two expressions in this equation what you get is the failure stress in terms of surface energy and the crack length right so they use this failure stress to predict the extension of a crack or formation of a crack right <clears throat> then the concept of energy release rate so griffith only give, gave that energy method irwin was the test g is equal to minus d pi by da you see here when dws by da is equal to minus db by da you get crack right so that is called g energy release rate rate because it is uh, per unit area so rate of change of energy for every unit area created by the applied load that is how you see so finally you get this g is equal to pi sigma square a by e and then when this g value reaches a critical value it's called critical energy release rate or fracture toughness etc there are many names right so critical energy release rate even today uh, when you discover a new material or when you make a new material by alloying process or additive manufacturing or whatever mostly alloying you you do alloying and then get new materials that's what a metallurgist and material scientists do so when new materials are created even polymeric materials many polymers are being created every day right so even these polymeric materials for structural applications like high density high density polyethylene or uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene or uh, polyamides there are many other uh, elastomers all of them require critical energy release rate so determination of critical energy release rate even today is very common even biomaterials bone there are many papers which discuss the critical energy release rate of bone bone human bone or animal bone right okay now the concept of energy release rate for certain examples there is a load control test and displacement control test in load control test what you do is you fix the load that is you attach the weight and allow the crack to extend as you keep adding weight crack will also slowly extend then there is a stage where no matter whether you add weight or not it will completely fail that is the critical crack length or the energy corresponding to that critical crack length is nothing but the critical energy release rate how to calculate that here is the formula for that so it's based on the energetics so you can verify this i will share these slides uh, to dinakaran sir after the talk so you can verify <clears throat> so this is displacement control again you get a simple similar expression the logic is same instead of attaching loads step by step you give displacement step by step that is what displacement control means that's the only difference right but the difference in mathematics part is in the former case you are doing work in the latter case you are controlling the work that is work done is zero you are only controlling the strain energy right so in either case you end up with the same expression for the energy release rate as indicated by these two red arrows so g equal to p square by 2b dc by da where a is the crack length c is called compliance it is the reciprocal of stiffness p by delta is the stiffness and delta by p is the compliance so in either case the expression for g remains the same so so this uh, uh, we came up with this uh, new concept uh, that is rate of strain energy change due to increase in the crack length whether it is load control or it is uh, 
displacement control, they are same and just negative of each other in magnitude. Okay, next slide. So this is a very common, uh, you know, uh, setup or a specimen. It's called a double cantilever beam. Whether it is to understand the, the mechanics of adhesion be between two similar or dissimilar materials, or whether it is to understand the cohesive energy within the same material. You can create a crack in a material and then extend it like a. So it's called double cantilever because <clears throat> wherever there is crack tip, that is a fixed end. And wherever there is a free end, that is a, a loaded end. So when you apply load, it's like uh, extending and then uh, it will act like a cantilever beam. So the deflection at free end and the loaded end are, uh, are like free end. So deflection at the free end is like the free end of the cantilever and the fixed end is nothing but the crack tip end. So you can use the deflection formula to get the compliance delta by P, right? So you get the compliance from the deflection load deflection formula and then you can find out the energy release rate excuse me for a while sir uh, dinakaran sir excuse me just, just please, sir. please please Uh, excuse me for that, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Oh, I'll continue. Okay. Now, here is a, a list of materials with a critical energy release rate. So, this I took from Prashant Kumar, sir's book. It's a very, uh, you know, uh, well established book. So, uh, it will give us an idea of uh, how energy per unit area is required, how much of energy per unit area is required to create a crack. Imagine for a, in a steel to create a unit area, one meter square of area, you need 250,000 uh, joules of energy to be given to that material. So, so that gives a feel of how strong a material is, right? And then uh, people uh, did not understand energetics. We're all engineers, right? This uh, thermodynamics and all, uh, I tell you a uh, one minute history on how thermodynamics and stresses evolved. Some people say that thermodynamics evolved, uh, started evolving before. For example, Clausius started thermodynamics in 17th century or 18th century. And in parallel, uh, I have shown you Leonardo da Vinci, Robert Hooke, all those people started uh, stress analysis. So they, they, that was a parallel evolution. They never mingled with each other. Only in the recent years, like, uh, Post World War II, uh, several people came up with continuum thermomechanics, thermodynamics, etc. But it's still it's not so you know well very well uh, combined. So we all uh, would like to have a stress-based criterion rather than energy-based criterion, and that's how the concept of stress intensity factor came. Now you might be able to re realize stress concentration factor in the case where there are notches, fillets holes and even elliptical holes of finite major axis, minor axis, right? So there you have stress concentration factor and here you have stress intensity factor. The stress intensity factor tells you the severity of the crack. While the stress concentration factor is depend up, dependent upon the severity of the geometrical feature. For example, if the fillet radius is very large, then the stress concentration is less. But if the fillet radius is very, very small, that means it's a sharp bend. Sharpness means very small radius of curvature. In that case, the stress concentration will be high. Now, if you reduce that stress concentration factor by you know, reducing the root radius to zero, nearly zero, it becomes a crack. That's when stress intensity factor comes, right? So in stress intensity factor, the length of the crack also becomes important. Whereas in stress concentration factor, for example, the ma only minor axis mattered, major axis did not matter. For example, in a hole, the size of the hole doesn't matter. 
the size of the hole relative to the width of the component matters. But here, length of the crack matters. That's what you call by blunt. In a blunt notch, the size effect is not there. But in a sharp notch, there is a size effect. Right? For example, here, you have A, crack length A coming into the stress solution. And this quantity circled, shown in red ellipse, is called a stress intensity factor for a center crack in a big hole, big plate. Center crack in a big plate, this is the stress intensity factor. And these are the displacements, uh, not relevant for us. Like that, uh, for more two also, you can have uh, different stress intensity factors. Of course, for more two, the lo uh, load application should be parallel to the crack face. And mode 3, it should be perpendicular to the plane that contains the crack, right? Perpendicular to the plane of the plate, right? Out of plane. Like that, you can introduce the concept of stress intensity factor. And then you have what is known as critical stress intensity factor or fracture toughness. In fracture toughness, uh, whenever, for example, there is a crack. Now we know there is a crack flies there i apply load i keep applying load then that is i do some minor uh, repair work and then i keep applying load right okay let me let me explain you from uh, beginning let's say now uh, you, in the beginning slide I, in the first slide i have shown you a pipe with a hole where there is a crack emanating from the circular hole that crack is invisible in the naked eye, to the naked eye but it gets caught when you subject it to a non NDT inspection. That crack, let's say I have decided that there is a crack. I have found that there is a crack. The size of the crack is very small, let us say. Now, I'll take a risk. I'll not do any repair work like welding. I'll subject it to further service. Now, I will calculate its stress intensity factor using the expression. Our finite element simulation also will give you stress intensity factor. You might have done some of you who are conducting research in computational mechanics might have already done it, right? Calculate that stress intensity factor and see if it is less than or equal to the, see if it is less than the critical stress intensity factor that I have given in the third column. Then it is safe. Otherwise it is unsafe. You have to do either repair work or completely change the part. So this is what is called damage tolerant design. So even when there is damage, I am ready to work as long as stress intensity factor doesn't exceed the stress concentration factor. Otherwise, I will change the part or repair the part. That is called damage tolerant design. Right? And then uh, application of uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics depends upon the plastic zone size. So all that we have seen is uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics. That is, you don't apply plasticity at all. But when, when is it applicable? Whenever the plastic zone size is smaller than the elastic limit, then only you can use the uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics. So for that, there are many estimates of plastic zone size, first order estimate, second order estimate, and then plane stress estimate, plane strain estimate, etc. Finally, you can see that uh, as long as you are in this regime, uh, you can uh, use linear elastic fracture mechanics without actually worrying about the plastic zone size. Right? Now a little bit about fractography, looking at the fracture markings. Linear marks in shear, it will look like this. Whereas in torsion, it will look circular, spiral, like this, spiral. And uh, when there are uh, boundaries very close to the crack, this is the origin of the crack. There will be markings called chevron markings. So uh, they will uh, constrain the uh, cracks to emanate radially. Instead, they'll just they'll just uh, uh, propagate and stop, right? And these are chevron radial markings in steel bar. So all of them are brittle cracks. Whereas in a ductile crack, you can see voids, dimpled surfaces. So these are SEM images. But just to give you a glimpse of how it appears, I'm sure many of you might have done enough experiments. And then this is brittle materials, faceted, clear uh, patterns, right? Now, micro mechanisms of crack arrest. 
either so this is what i was mentioning why do cracks arrest in metals or why do plastic deformation occur in metals it is dislocations so in the leftmost figure what i am showing here is crack arrested particle matrix interface whenever there is a dislocation that uh, uh, that sees a boundary an interface boundary it will get arrested if the dislocations don't move then the cracks cannot propagate plastic deformation cannot occur similarly crack arrest due to high stress gradients that occur right that can also cause a crack to arrest then crack arrest at the grain boundaries grain boundaries are high energy boundaries uh, high and high energy surfaces in solid so you require higher energy to break open it's like a barricade to the crack right so like that these are the various mechanisms why cracks delay that they require higher energy that's why polycrystalline materials are uh, stronger than single crystal materials this is a well known fact so ductile to brittle transition this is very important in design for example ductile material if you assume that the material is to be ductile and the failure is to be ductile and do the design and if it fails brittle then it's a severe loss most of the aerospace aeroplane fa failures you all know if it is failure in the fuselage or uh, tank or near the hotter side of the turbine that's because of this misunderstanding between ductile to brittle transition okay so uh, there is this famous experiment called izard or charpy impact test or sometimes uh, uh, these days they are doing even a punch test single punch test small punch test in order to do ductile to brittle transition fatigue fracture mechanisms in fatigue fracture once there is a small flaw the repeated loading will cause stress concentration to occur and the stress intensity will actually cause the crack to grow so here a schematic is shown how the uh, stop grow crack mechanism is stop grow means the crack will grow a bit and then stop and then grow a bit and then stop and then grow a bit and stop so that is called stop grow mechanism so crack propagation takes place in several stages like this right so here you can see a, a weldment is causing a crack to initiate so these are the various uh, uh, fatigue failure uh, examples uh, how a fatigue failure looks like in all these cases there is one common thing i mean common things are there is an origin of crack and then there is a stop grow mechanism of the fatigue crack growth after that there is a catastrophic failure that indicates a very clean surface clean means a very brittle surface right same here here so this is due to fatigue failure of pile and uh, this is a micrograph optical micrograph okay fatigue prediction methods already i told stress life and strain life right stress based method and strain based method are already done how do you do using linear elastic fracture mechanics before that we have to predict the mixed mode uh, loading so these things i have already told low cycle high cycle already i have discussed okay this is where when you have variable loading like this uh, you demarcate them into different different bins for example you have an extremely varying loading uh, loading what you do you demarcate them into different different uh, bins each bin corresponds to a particular number of cycles right particular amplitude of stress for that amplitude of stress or strain whatever it is stress based or strain based for that amplitude of stress or strain you will identify the number of cycles like that for each bin you will have identified number of cycles summation of all those cycles divided by the total uh, failure right that will give you a fraction if that fraction reaches 1 that will be an indication that a particular point has failed damage has initiated crack has formed otherwise we will continue to accumulate the number of cycles this is called 
what you call this this is called miner's rule cumulative damage theory that is you keep accumulating damage every cycle and then slowly you you as soon as it reaches one you declare that the point has failed right so whatever i have told is explained here if n1 cycles at s1 stress causes fatigue failure and n2 cycles causes s2 at fatigue failure then when failure occurs because of small n1 small n2 small n n then the the uh, number of uh, cycles that it can withstand is capital n1 plus capital n2 plus capital n n such that the fraction sum up to 100% right now in any fatigue crack growth uh, regime it looks like this whatever i am showing here is a curve of fatigue crack propagation versus stress intensity factor so it has three regions initially for a small raise in uh, uh, this uh, delta k delta k is nothing but now we are discussing fatigue so k means stress intensity factor it's like a load delta k is application of stress intensity uh, stress intensity factor for a small raise in delta k initially the small uh, size flaw will grow rapidly and after that there is a linear regime and again there will be uh, super crack growth right so these three regions have to be modeled effectively so normally for the middle region it is paris law for the initial region either strain based fatigue life or stress based fatigue life or that mixture model minus rule can be used for the final we don't really bother we treat that in the beginning of the third region is nothing but the failure time right so there are many expressions for uh, uh, delta a by delta n or da by dn so this is called paris law very common and there are many other things for example uh, nash grow crack growth model is there nash grow so all those things are possible there are many papers now it's very popular fatigue crack growth is very popular continuum damage mechanics we are uh, reaching the last stage of this uh, presentation continuum damage mechanics when we have voids you know the change the volume of the voids to the volume of the parent solid represents the percentage of flaws in the material that can be a fraction to indicate the quality of that material or the damage percent of the material for example 0% damage means if dv is equal to 0 then there are no voids 50% means in a unit area there are 50% of voids so 0.5 means 50% has damaged 0.3 means 30% has damaged something like that so since there are voids there will be stress concentration and that is given by sigma by 1 minus t so this is the origin of that continuum damage mechanics so there are these are these models uh, for ductile fracture uh, continuum damage mechanics for example uh, uh, limatres model limatres model is a is a is a french uh, scientist uh, he, has, he has written several books uh, so on damage mechanics there are, there are at least two or three books and several papers have been written so this is a ductile fracture model purely based on uh, micro mechanics so he derived it from scratch similarly gerson's model very very popular gerson's model is there in abacus ansys in most of the commercial packages this gerson's model have also been has also been derived from micro mechanics approach when i say micro mechanics approach he considers a whole spherical hole or cylindrical hole and then allows it to expand and derive the stress field around it equate it to the macroscopic stress field and then try to fit a keel surface that's what these two methods are on the other hand the third one is a phenomenological model means it's a curve fitted to the experimental data right in all these cases you can see the sigma h here in the first equation sigma h in the second equation and sigma star in the third equation contains the average stress that i showed in the von mises criteria so all these things are an extension of von mises criteria so now an application you all know blanking operation right blanking operation where uh, uh, you remove material from a blank uh, it's blanking operation <coughs> so there is this punch die and then you subject it to uh, blanking operation the 
it is subjected to blunt thing operation. So there will be crack starting from this edges, and the crack has to eventually uh, mature and then completely fracture. So for this, uh, this paper by Humbly et al. Uh, in International Journal of Mechanical Sciences applied the Gerson's model and Limathrace damage model and found that Limathrace damage model was efficient in capturing the uh, blanking force versus punch penetration uh, data. So you have to use accurate model, right? There are two models now, but one of them is better, right? So clearly, Gerson's model could not capture the blanking force, especially the decreasing part, no? It is not able to capture, whereas Limathrace model is able to capture, right? So this is how it looks like uh, when finite element simulation of uh, punch and die is done, uh, the fracture occurs like this. Uh, so nowadays you have in abacus element deletion, etc. So this was done in LSD, I suppose. So very old paper, 2001. And then another important criterion. This is by Borwick et al. in European Journal of Mechanics, uh, Mechanics of Solids. So they subjected the steel plate to armor penetration and uh, they could represent uh, the theory, sorry, experiment through simulations also. So you can see the experiment, experiments and simulations results are, uh, you know, matching. Uh, and the model that they used is Johnson Cook model, right? So coming to my work, I am interested in uh, developing mesh-free methods to model such fracture phenomena. So whenever there is, for example, if you use finite element, right, in, in all the previous cases, they have used finite element. In the, if you use finite element, right, in the finite element, you have element connectivity. Nodes are connected. You need to give that element connectivity in every step. Otherwise, the stiffness matrix cannot be built, right? So when you have a crack, for example, there's a crack here, so the when the material has separated, the elements have broken. Now element, a node which was common to two elements is no longer common. It is split into two nodes. So this becomes a very complex phenomenon to handle. It's very difficult to solve. On the other hand, in mesh-free methods, it's quite straightforward. There is no element connectivity. Between two material points, there will be a crack that will come up. I'll show you how it happens. So basically you will have a discrete set of points and then uh, the idea is to get approximation for, uh, uh, you know, the spatial derivatives. So this is all mathematics. So I'll, I'll skip the details of the mathematics. But you know, the conservation of mass, linear momentum, energy is something that we solve in all the equations, in all the problems, whether it is solid mechanics or fluid mechanics, you have these three, these three, uh, these three laws of, uh, you know, conservation. And uh, this is what you will solve. solve. They are the partial differential equations you will end up solving. So wherever there are spatial derivatives, we will seek spatial derivatives using meshless approximations. And then advance to time t plus delta t. So you get these expressions, which I'll skip. So this is based on Taylor series approximation. I'll skip this part. So uh, I validated it uh, using a uh, wave propagation in solid. So what I do is I impact at the left end. And then the, when the wave propagates, uh, I'm plotting the analytical solution versus numerical solution. So it's a good uh, validation. And then uh, here in an elasto viscoplastic solid, I see compression of the solid. This is useful when you are simulating forging, upset forging operation or uh, rolling operation to see evolution of shear bands. So that would be the next step, right? And this is actually a brittle fracture case where uh, an annular rock, it's a hypothetical case, but then rocks can be assumed to be circular. So an annular rock is dropped at a velocity of 100 meters per second. And uh, this is how it fractures. You can observe the fracture uh, simulation. So all these results are from my PhD thesis. I did my PhD in IIT Kanpur. I developed a mesh-free code on uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, so these are my results. And then I also did some uh, powder compaction and uh, created uh, shock-induced chemical reactions. So this is another uh, work. And then I did something called uh, peridynamics, where, uh, I'll skip the mathematics part, where, I'll just show you this. The momentum equation is replaced by a force term, an integral term. 
so you don't have any spatial derivatives so spatial derivatives are not uh, applicable wherever there is discontinuity in a continuum it's a concept of continuum right so derivative is defined as left continuous and right continuous right the left continuous and right continuous should be equal at a point then only you will say derivative exists at that point like that whenever there is a crack derivative doesn't exist there because left continuity and right continuity is not there imagine a crack like this and displacement like this so at that point the right side moves to the right and the left side moves to the left so there is a discontinuity in the displacement so if you take limit uh, it won't be equal so it's not left continuous and right continuous right so in such cases you can't use spatial derivatives partial differential equations are not applicable therefore you come up with what is known as peridynamic theory which is very recent about two decades old in 2000 uh, professor silling from sandia national laboratories proposed this so i took this work uh, in the last 3 years i'm working on it so a very preliminary result is what i'm going to show this is actually brittle crack propagation with crack branching the idea is to understand how cracks branch and then how they arrest crack branches no whenever crack extends and starts branching there will be an extra energy required so that's what we are interested to see so this is very initial stage of work i mean it's too early to comment uh, on uh, the contribution to the overall uh, picture but then uh, uh, with time the results will be more and more useful yeah, here after i am going to show only animations i mean there is not much to discuss because they are all my simulations that requires lot of math yeah thanks for your time i have had a wonderful uh, discussion i suppose i hope yes, i have uh, i have not exceeded my time sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. thank you sir thank you sir it was nice and a lot of information were uh, uh, given to the participants i hope this uh, uh, information they uh, might have not got uh, this much in detail i believe because i also uh, learned much more from your lecture uh, so sir, uh, thank you so much thank you so much for uh, giving order for lecture so let us uh, have some questions sir from participant sides sure sir sure definitely i am very happy to yes sir <coughs> Angira Gupta, you have been allowed to come into live and ask the question with Sir. So, please switch off the video and ensure your connectivity and come online and ask the question to Sir. And Mena Guru, you have also been allowed. And Vishnu, you also have been allowed. if you all three come we will take these three questions and we will wind up the session hello yeah ஒருவன்ஸ் <laughs> 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 Irvin's law in fracture. Sir, Irvin introduced critical energy release rate, sir. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Irvin is the one who introduced critical energy release rate, sir. Today, critical energy release rate is used uh, not only in uh, experiments, but also in cohesive zone metrology, sir. One uh, metrology is their computational metrology, cohesive zone approach. So, for that, uh, the parameters are discussed or derived uh, using Irvin's approach only, sir. critical energy release rate so you have to determine critical energy release rate and the uh, strain to failure to get cohesive zone parameters super sir thank you sir thank you sir 
sir another one question sir can yes. you uh, explain me one mrs criteria one mrs criteria sir sir one mrs criteria is uh, <coughs> energy based sir stress cause criteria is shear stress based one mrs criteria is energy based for example let's take a solid i deform it like this when i subject it to deformation there is both the volume change as well as uh, shape change shape change is sometimes permanent but volume change is never permanent unless there are voids inside this material so that volume change energy alone contributes to the plastic deformation that is failure which we call as failure yielding means failure so that volume change energy must be either equal or greater than the energy due to yield stress then only you call it uh, failed so that that criterion is called one mrs criterion okay so thank you sir thank you sir thank you, thank you. and i think no participants are coming online and sir uh, thank you so much thank you sir even though i have requested to with a short period short notice so we hope uh, come and given a very very good lecture okay sir and i hope we we you would like to hear you a lot in forthcoming sessions also in uh, sir so thank you so much for your wonderful time we will meet on some other occasion sir thank you sir welcome sir, sir. <laughs> thank you sir. Uh, dear participant thank you so much and uh, has given a uh, wonderful lecture and i uh, so uh, he has given some uh, even though a crack uh, and uh, fracture are very uh, uh, toughest topic to understand he has uh, given in a nice way and which can uh, be understood easily by all so thank you so much for uh, for uh, to dr Uh, Sir Prasad, here he is, and uh, uh, participants. So I uh, I hope shared on uh, I hope uh, shared some uh, links through X mail as well as in groups. Uh, so please uh, fill it carefully and attach the requirements carefully, which are rec- which will which are to evaluate and to print the certificates. Okay, so. photograph you prop, provide the proper uh, uh, professional photograph as it is requested and uh, the information what we have requested in the cool form have to be filled carefully okay so uh, please ensure uh, twice or thrice and submit the application submit the form okay. um, then as we have discussed so this uh, uh, ftp uh, even though we 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 are spending almost around 4 hours only for lectures and to uh, make it as a, a 40 hours ftp which can be uh, accepted by any accreditation agency so we we have told you to uh, study the basics of the particular sessions and uh, we are giving some uh, assignments through the uh, cool class so Uh, today uh, evening five to six, so we will have uh, uh, two um, what we call two queues. So one will be on engineering graphics and one will be on uh, fundamental designs. So uh, these two uh, queues can be easily attempted with your understanding of the particular lectures and the. Uh, these things will be soon available in the Google Classroom. So it will be open at five o'clock and it will be closed at six o'clock. So within which, so within that period, you can complete the two. Uh, uh, I mean, two quiz, uh, quiz. Okay. Mm. Then, uh, if any uh, doubt, you can uh, text me through WhatsApp. And I hope today's sessions might have, uh, might have yielded something. And uh, it might might enhance something. Uh, it, it will it might have enhanced some knowledge of you. And I hope so. Uh, tomorrow at morning first sessions we have uh, the fundamentals of synthetic material, which is going to be handled by Dr. Yam Subhashan Mugam uh, from uh, National Institute of Technology. He is my guru. Uh, and after the sessions, we 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 are going to uh, hear from uh, Dr. G L Samuvel. Uh, about manufacturing and metrology uh, uh, so he is the professor from 
Indian Infrared Technology Madras. So be connected. Uh, we will meet in the uh, tomorrow or tomorrow sessions. And please attempt if, if, if uh, some of you are not joined in WhatsApp proof, if some of you are not joined in the cool classroom, please do it immediately. Uh, uh, attempt the uh, questions between five to six. After that, that we will love. Okay. So uh, this initiative is uh, to really make the uh, FTP as a very successful one and to be uh, worthy. And that's why uh, uh, we have taken these initiatives as like other uh, uh, governmental organization uh, and how they uh, approved F FT, uh, FTP, FTP visa conductor. So in the same way, uh, Chennai Institute Technology is proud to conduct uh, as like others, other other institutes are being conducting. Thank you so much. We will meet you tomorrow and be connected in WhatsApp and uh, complete the case. Thank you.